So before I start, I'd, uh, I'd like to thank in particular Jan um, for this very nice introduction. Um, uh, it's very impressive what you guys have built in Iowa. And um, yeah, thank you very much for this, for this overview. And um, now I feel in fact uh, even more isolated here in my little room in Amsterdam seeing these lovely rivers and, uh, and parks and um, all the excitement over there in Iowa. So I hope at some point that um, well, we'll all meet in person, uh, person again. But yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, thanks a lot um, for for having me on this uh, yeah on this day here in in this um, in this symposium. I'm really looking forward uh, to to the many talks um, today. I'd like to take you <clears throat> on a little excursion. So Jan already mentioned that um, our work is quite multifaceted, um, and um, what I'd like to uh, start out with is, in fact, um, work that we've been conducting over the past many years, focusing on neuroanatomy. And in fact, it all uh, kind of started with this very simple <clears throat> question um, that we asked sitting together in the lab um, and uh, looking, in fact, uh, through articles, uh, reading articles and realizing that uh, often in connectomic studies, um, or whatnot, imaging studies, you see this black hole in the middle of the brain. And so uh, in the end, we just uh, wondered, well, why uh, aren't they colored as nicely as you've seen in these connectivity maps? And so we just simply asked how many sub subcortical structures um, are there actually in the brain? Seeing, in fact, also the impressive work by Van Essen and Glascher um, about uh, cortical mapping. And so we, uh, we wondered, well, what can we do? Uh, and so consulted with the uh, Federated Community on Anatomical Terminology and started to count. And so we came to the impressive number of approximately 455 unique subcortical structures. And this is, if you compare this uh, to the nice work of Van Essen, but also from uh, Rudolf Mühlenhaus, who's a neuroanatomist here in Amsterdam, um, then this is uh, two and a half times approximately more than uh, what they propose, in fact, cortex uh, contains in terms of areas or parcellations. So it's quite an impressive number and eventually also a little bit of a shock, at least when I saw this. Um, so I wondered um, uh, next, in fact, how many uh, can we reach using non-invasive magnetic resonance imaging? Not, so, not, not only in fact that, but how many have been mapped? So with that, I mean that there are regions of interest or atlas maps that you can simply co-register with your imaging data, uh, structural or functional, uh, to compute uh, analysis. And so in that point in time, <clears throat> we found that only uh, the impressive number of 7% were mapped. By now, this may be a bit higher, um, but not by much. And so um, just to give you an idea um, how this looks like. So here you see a radial hierarchical tree of all these uh, 455 areas, and it goes down to this level of detail. And in fact, on the right side, you see the current coverage, um, again, maybe a bit broader, um, but not by much um, of um, the subcortical areas that are in standard atlases, which are readily uh, to be co-registered uh, with, your, with your imaging data. And so <clears throat> why is this relevant? Jan already mentioned also exciting collaborations with uh, neurosurgeons. In fact, um, we've also engaged a bit uh, in that avenue. And when we think about the deep brain, I think, um, uh, movement disorders come to mind very easily, including Parkinson patients and uh, deep brain stimulation in Parkinson patients, in particular in the subthalamic nucleus. But we see that also many other disease groups are in fact um, are using deep brain stimulation to alleviate effects such as obsessive compulsive um, disorders, anorexia, depression, um, and many more. So. Um, it is uh, certainly very interesting to study um, the subcortex also out of a clinical neuroscience perspective. Um, but so uh, we went on and we speculated it a bit. Um, why is it now so difficult maybe to map the human subcortex? Because there must be reasons uh, why in fact um, this is such an charted, um, uncharted territory. So we're pretty much really talking about uh, terra incognita if you want. And I think um, there are several reasons that uh, are, are, quite, um, are, are quite intuitive. One of them is um, simply these nuclei are um, fairly small. And in fact, sometimes so small that um, uh, we can't even resolve them actually in vivo, very high resolution imaging. Um, another thing is, as you see in this map on the right, they lie in close proximity to each other. And we'll get back to that and what that poses in terms of 
problems when imaging the human subcortex. And then in fact, there are two more um, aspects and one is actually a biophysical one, which you see here. So some of them have high iron content, which impacts actually on, for example, the relaxation times with which we can measure these nuclei using functional MRI. And I'm also returning to that. Another one is actually a physical reason. So if you think of how we collect MRI data, um, then uh, we use often a whole head coil. And in fact, these channels are far away from the midbrain. And in fact, quite equidistantly far away from the midbrain. And so um, that's already in itself, plus inhomogeneities that we eventually face in, in the subcortex adds up to really uh, great challenges of getting good signal, um, in particular temporal signal to noise ratios um, in these areas. So it's, um, it's quite a challenge and feat, in fact, um, to get uh, deep into the brain. And I'm gonna uh, show some examples and what can be done eventually uh, to overcome these. So first of all, um, what we uh, did in the last, uh, last many years is in fact, um, we started to create um, so-called a HAT7 Tesla MRI database. Um, this is a structural database um, that is now uh, freely available. Um, you can download it uh, immediately and um, you will have data from approximately hundred subjects with an age range of 18 to 80 years. Um, I think what's really nice about this database is, is um, that it's now not only seven Tesla, um, but in fact, um, it was um, imaged with a so-called MP2HME sequence. And uh, this is a quantitative sequence um, that in fact contains different contrasts, as you see here. So T1 rated, T2 star rated, and eventually we also computed quantitative susceptibility maps. You see those here on the right. And I think if you look carefully uh, at the maps and also um, at these zoomed in images, you will immediately see um, that they contain very different contrasts and in fact highlight also and give contrast to uh, different structures. So in particular, the QSM contrast, which is highly iron sensitive, um, we can in fact very nicely um, visualize first of all structures that are high in iron content, such as the uh, subthalamic nucleus or the globus pallidus. And this was important for us um, because first of all, what we wanted to use this for is um, to create manually atlas maps. So we wanted to increase these 7% that I just presented to you. And in fact, it's a very long way um, to do that um, because our approach is that, um, in fact, a neuroanatomist in the lab, senior neuroanatomist, uh, Annika Alkemade, she and her team, it's a huge team um, that she built around her, um, uh, basically went ahead and devised uh, new protocols um, for um, approximately 22 structures for now. We're increasing this number as we go um, and uh, manually really basically paint or delineate uh, these structures. And then we've used these um, manual delineation uh, to develop actually an automatic um, segmentation procedure. And this just came out uh, by another collaborator in the lab, Pierre-Louis Bazin, who's a senior scientist. And he developed the so-called MASP algorithm um, which is also all freely down for download and also the maps and approach uh, and so forth. Um, and um, this allows you to automatically um, uh, delineate uh, 22 individual supported nuclei uh, so far. And here we're talking mainly um, the basal ganglia nuclei um, and uh, some additional control regions as well. Um, we're working our way right now towards the thalamus. Um, which is yet another huge challenge. Um, as people may know who have worked and looked into sal salamic nuclei or nuclei that comprise the salamos. And in fact, um, that led us also to see that um, even this high resolution approach um, in vivo is eventually not sufficient um, for some structures actually to bring um, uh, into our uh, functional imaging results, for example. So we, um, well, we, and now we, we took the long, very long route. And this is in fact why I'm rerouting you also through this anatomy because I'm very excited about um, what I'm going to show you now. It's a project that we just finished, um, at least the first part of it. And it is very related uh, in spirit actually to the big brain approach from Katrin Amunds and many collaborators. Because what we did here is in fact, um, we um, imaged um, a whole brain uh, post-mortem specimen 
Um, and we imaged that specimen on uh, SEP and Tesla MRI, but also on connect home scanning in order to get actually a diffusivity. Um, and then we started to reconstruct this entire human brain in 3D from 200 micron sections and also block face imaging. So what, it, what this means is that we, um, after imaging this brain, we started to cut it up uh, in these 200 micron slices. And so <clears throat> here you just briefly see a movie how this, uh, how this reconstruction looks like. Um, it is incredibly detailed. And here you see now actually um, a histological 2D stainings of cell bodies and fibers. Um, and we used five different um, of these stains that were then all co-aligned again and also co-aligned with the um, MRI. And here are the different, in fact, also MPM maps. So these are also uh, multimodal maps um, of this whole brain specimen, which allowed us to basically bring all of this information uh, of this one brain back together in one space. And so <clears throat> I hope um, that we um, soon enough can release this data uh, also freely, which is the plan. Uh, so that you can, in fact, use this incredibly high detailed information again with your in vivo data. So this, uh, the co-registration of this will be very simple um, and easy made. Um, and um, you can, in fact, learn about uh, yeah, cellular uh, differences between structures. But for now, our focus is on further delineating small subcortical nuclei and in particular zooming in on the thalamus, um, which um, I can already say may not even so this resolution may not even suffice uh, to get all of all of them, but a great deal of them. Um, so as I said, we are incredibly careful with evaluating um, our protocols, uh, manual protocols, but then also submitting them to this um, automatic um, segmentation algorithm. But so in the next or in the first um, part of this of this talk, I'd actually like to dive in for a moment a little deeper into imaging now of the human subcortex with ultra high field functional MRI. And in the second part, um, because of course I am actually not an anatomist, not at all. I'm kind of a psychologist, really. I am, uh, which is a bit awkward. And it's like this um, anatomical work, you may think. <clears throat> But uh, as I said, with great expertise in the lab, it is possible. I'd like to go back and use this information actually to understand brain function mechanisms. Um, so using a model-based cognitive neuroscience approach, um, which combines modeling and imaging. But we'll get, we'll get to that. And I hope you see that these parts are actually highly related and intertwined. Um, <clears throat> yet uh, we spent many years on developing both uh, research lines really in, yeah, in, in careful, great detail. But so first of all, when imaging, for example, now the subthalamic nucleus, and I'm, I'm sure knowing Jan, we will hear more about the STN eventually, and maybe from, from others as well. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it, yeah, it's a fascinating structure. Uh, uh, even after having looked at it now for many years, I, I'm, it troubles me still. Um, it gives riddles. It's amazing. Um, and um, uh, I learned very early on and, and also from, from work really from Cho and many others in the field that um, ultra high resolution imaging is very beneficial when we um, start to zoom in these small structures and in particular the SDN, simply because of its uh, size. Um, and also it's challenging because it has a high iron content, which is quite heterogeneous. Um, so um, it takes quite some effort to really nicely actually, first of all, image it. Um, but then what we learned um, in conducting the first functional MRI experiments um, using SEP and Tesla is a phenomenon that, um, yeah, that, um, that, that I think physicists are well aware of um, and maybe many others. I was not, and um, I'm, I feel still a bit guilty about it because um, basically I led my PhD student, Gilles de Hollander, to take quite a long route to find out um, <laughs> To do an experiment realizing that actually our tempo signals noise ratios were incredibly low and um, that we just simply have no signal deep down there until we realized that what's going on is that um, the relaxation times um, need to be fairly different if you'd like to zoom in on the midbrain and in particular actually on iron rich nuclei such as the SDN is or the SN globus pallidus um, and some others. And so what you see here in this graph is actually the signal delay. And usually um, what we actually determine as the kind of common time is um, a time that resembles most maybe the green line. So between 22 to um, 30 or uh, 28 milliseconds um, 
are actually, or echotypes are usually used um, to image, image the brain. And this is actually a good value, I think, in particular, if you're interested in cortex. And uh, this is also how we started out. Um, but what happens um, when you look at the right here and the upper map is that, in fact, um, the temporal signal to noise is incredibly low. And so if we shorten this time now, which we did up to 40 milliseconds, um, we start to actually increase signal uh, also deep in, the, in, this, in this deep brain nuclei. So we, <clears throat> in fact, um, well, we found out the hard way um, and we learned a lot um, actually um, yeah, simulating this, looking into this deeper. And then we actually went back uh, to experimentation and we compared um, four different protocols, which you see here. So these, are, these were three uh, seven Tesla MRI protocols and one three T MRI protocol with uh, different fields of view, as you can see here in these um, copper uh, copper coded, uh, let's say, uh, box. Um, and here you see um, the parameters that we vary next to also acceleration factors. I should mention, but so we varied the resolution between one point two isotropic resolution to one point five, um, and um, crucially also manipulated the echo times from twenty two milliseconds all the way down to 14 milliseconds. And uh, with these four protocols armed, um, we scanned five healthy subjects um, and used um, five individually um, delineated, manually delineated um, uh, anatomical basal ganglia masks to explore further the uh, temporal signal to noise ratios. And this is what we found. Um, so here you see across the board of these uh, five basal ganglia nuclei separated for left and right hemisphere, for um, the different protocols that we have a clear winner. And this clear winner on the voxel TSNR, but also on the region of interest temporal signal to noise level is in fact um, um, a sequence that has 1.5 millimeter isotropic resolution. So it's not uh, super high submillimeter and um, a very short echo time of 14 milliseconds. Um, I am sure that this can in be increased even further. So this is in fact uh, work we could replicate in uh, two studies now that are published. And um, in fact, we continued also piloting and trying many more settings out. But for now, um, we moved on, in fact, using um, these settings, um, which um, we are quite satisfied with. But so another um, important, I think, aspect uh, to consider zooming now into um, in subcortical nuclei. And in fact, I should say, um, this is not only optimizing for subcortex, but in fact, this protocol that I present here is also a protocol that delivers nice signal in cortex. So cortex uh, is, if you want, fairly forgiving. And in, in that sense, what we developed here is in fact a whole brain sequence, uh, a true whole brain sequence in that sense, in that you get signal both in subcortex, but also actually in cortex. Um, but another reason or another issue to consider is in fact, <clears throat> which you often read is uh, smoothing and um, uh, in fact, the size of smoothing kernels that are usually employed. And uh, here you see an eight millimeter half, full width half maximum filter that um, is again, quite common, I think in the literature. Um, there are many reasons I'm sure to use such a filter, but what happens is you see that in the lower panel immediately is that of course you kind of smooth signal uh, um, across the regions. So you end up in fact picking up signal um, not unequivocally from one nucleus, but you smear basically signal um, also in neighboring structures. And that can also be simulated um, how much signal in fact um, you kind of mix uh, in this way. Um, so uh, preferably, in fact, uh, a little smoothing um, is, is, I guess, um, one way to go um, to go about that, which again deviates also slightly from more cortex-oriented protocols. But so um, armed now with with um, th this knowledge, um, we moved on and um, uh, we used, in fact, the stop signal reaction time task to test this now, all because it is a very nice task, um, well established in the field. Um, also to show, in fact, activation in basal ganglia nuclei. And we saw this is a perfect paradigm actually to um, probe and uh, replicate in the first place um, previous findings. And so just in a nutshell, the stop signal task is a reaction time task in which uh, go trials are presented. Um, these often consist of arrows pointing to the right or to the left. And according to the direction of the arrow, uh, participants press a right or left response button respectively. And then on a, um, a fraction of trials, um, a stop trial may occur. Um, and stop trial 
is associated with, for example, a tone that um, signals to withhold a response. And so the um, tricky issue about these drop charts is that we can manipulate the so-called SSD, the stop signal time, which makes it harder or easier to withhold a response, which in the end yields um, an additional condition, and that is in fact failed inhibition trials. So we do have three conditions, if you like, and maybe many more. Um, but in this, um, in this experiment, we focused in fact and set onsets on both trials, on successful um, stop trials and on failed um, stop trials. And with this, um, we then scanned 20 healthy subjects, um, again, with these um, highly um, or individual high resolution anatomical basal ganglia masks to uh, zoom further in. First of all, I show you here the whole brain contrast, and that is um, not that exciting, I would say. Um, what you see across the board is a classical kind of stopping, failed stopping network, um, including uh, the many regions that have been reported before in the literature, including prefrontal cortex, um, basal ganglia, uh, maybe insula, and so forth. What's more striking is, in fact, when we now look at this. Um, so we see that, in fact, um, the midbrain uh, and around the STN, which is um, which is this structure here, um, there are there seems to be much more going on than just in the STN. That's the first um, let's say visualization I think, or uh, what you what you descriptively see here. In addition to that, um, and I think this plot makes this even clearer, is that eventually this is not necessarily a stopping network, but what we see here, in fact, it's actually a failed inhibit network. Um, and I think this is actually also really nicely in line with um, the great ideas that, that Jan, for example, put forward in the literature um, and really unique ideas, which in fact we empirically kind of stumbled across, uh, if you want, um, seeing that across the board of these uh, prominent basal ganglia nuclei, STN, substantia nigra, red nucleus, globus pallidus interna, and, and now this one, the globus pallidus externa, that we see um, a significant difference between failed stop trials to go, um, but also successful stop trials, and that there is no significant difference between successful stops and go trials. And that I found quite striking. Um, and uh, eventually also at some, in some respects then uh, troubling because um, for the STN, at least I would have expected a clear difference um, between the two conditions. But so we could replicate now this finding um, uh, at least two times. Um, using this <clears throat> high resolution approach. And I think there's also a paper in 3T uh, actually um, showing a similar pattern. So it's, it's something that uh, eventually is there. And we see that <clears throat> in fact, as I said, many more regions are uh, in fact activated during uh, the stop signal and the stop signal paradigm, including also for sure the thalamus as a block, we could detect that, but it would be exciting. And uh, that's hopefully possible in the next step to zoom in cl more closely in which nuclei and thalamus are actually, um, is, is, uh, is what happening. But so um, this, is, this was um, really a detour showing you just the approach uh, and using now post-mortem anatomy in vivo high resolution structural imaging, paving the way really actually to functional MRI, ultra high field functional MRI work. And in the second part, I'd like to extend this work and research um, now using a model-based approach. And what I mean with that is it's actually going really uh, even a bit further back in time um, and um, presenting you um, actually the framework with which I started out um, as, as a postdoc really in, in Amsterdam, working with uh, Richard Ritteringhoff and then also with uh, EJ Wagenmakers and uh, many other collaborators from the mathematical psychology field. The idea here is actually quite simple. Um, what we'd like to do is we'd like to um, understand latent cognitive processes. And we'd like to do that um, by basically using formal mathematical models. Uh, think of sequential sampling models, such as the uh, diffusion decision model. And this is also a model I, I, I will present to you today, together with brain imaging data. And so um, basically, um, we have focused on developing the formal models further. Um, I have just shown you what we have done in this field, um, advancing, or hoping to advance actually the uh, brain imaging site. And we have also looked more deeply into how we can jointly model, in fact, um, formal model parameters that reflect latent cognitive processes with brain imaging data. <clears throat> what I'm going to present to you today is, in fact, just um, 
actually a unidirectional um, arrow. That means that we inform our vein imaging data using uh, latent cognitive process model parameters of individuals. So, but um, the, the, the question really that we were after in this experiment is one that I think um, many neurosurgeons um, uh, uh, believed uh, and maybe not even doubted that much. Um, then again, um, the work by Yasin Temel is, is quite prominent and to be named here, um, who also um, in fact uh, is, is, um, made up this uh, schema and it's a very simplified schema, but um, I think just to basically get, uh, get over the idea is uh, whether there are three uh, distinct uh, functional or even structural subdivisions in the subthalamic nucleus. And this question is led, in fact, by findings or also by uh, reports from the neurosurgeons neurosurg in that using the brain stimulation in the SDN um, and, uh, in fact, hoping to target the motor area in order to alleviate motor symptoms, eventually also side effects in the cognitive or in the motivational domain are observed. And with that, I mean, for example, suicidal ideation or a cognitive decline. And so stemming from these side effects, in addition to other observations, um, this question, in fact, um, came up. Um, and this is also what we then went ahead, realizing how small the SDN is and um, that we, in fact, eventually need ultra high field resolution, first of all, structurally, to get closer and get a grip on this uh, small nucleus to test this hypothesis. And so this is what we did. Um, so here you see um, a structural image. Um, through the midbrain, um, looking at uh, th uh, three um, distinct compartments in the SDN, uh, where we used principal component analysis um, to um, parcelate the SDN in a dorsal lateral central and video ventral medial aspect, which resulted overall in approximately 5.5 voxels. So this is very, very little, of course, um, and, um, and taken with great caution, obviously. Um, but that is, in fact, what with a 1.5 isotropic resolution you will kind of get um, um, using the approach that we used. Um, and as I said, we used exactly this optimized uh, seven Tesla uh, sequence with these short echo times. And here we used, in fact, um, um, a quite more complicated um, experimental paradigm because um, we wanted uh, yeah, to test these uh, motivational, cognitive, or motor domains in the SDN. And so um, we employed a random dot motion kinematogram task um, this is seen here in the middle. This is a task where a cloud of dots is presented in the middle of a screen and um, a, a fraction of these dots move coherently either to the left or to the right in our experiment. And so subjects simply have to indicate with a left or right response button press in which direction uh, the dots moved. In this experiment, we also manipulated the difficulty of this task by means of <clears throat> changing the coherence of the moving dots and making the task therefore easier or more difficult. We also used so-called bias cue or payoff cues. And um, these are cues that indicated um, on most of the trials validly um, the direction of the moving dots. Um, or in fact, in some cases, there was a neutral cue, so giving no prior information. Um, and um, these uh, cues could also, in fact, be invalid. So uh, leading um, the um, uh, biasing um, the participants in the wrong direction. And then we also employ different um, reward schemes, rewarding correct and incorrect uh, validly and invalidly Q trials. I'm not focusing on this aspect in the paradigm today, um, but will only present, in fact, um, um, uh, activations set on these payoff cues um, and on the random dot motion kinematogram uh, stim stimulus. Um, we scanned in total 34 healthy subjects. Um, and again, with this high resolution uh, optimized approach. And so um, this is model-based because, uh, in fact, the um, reaction time data resulting from this task was modeled with the diffusion decision model, which you see here. And I'm sure uh, many of you are uh, very familiar with this model, which is very prominent in the literature for many years, decades, in fact. And in a nutshell, um, the assumption is, is that um, we basically start from a starting point and um, once, the, uh, once, in fact, um, the uh, stimulus comes on and then um, evidence is accumulated over time. This is a stochastic process in this representation. There are other models that simplify this process until a decision threshold is hit um, for either the correct or incorrect response for a two-force choice task as in our experiment. 
And so what we believed here to manipulate in this model using this experiment is, is that with these payoff cues, so giving prior information, you would shift around the start point. And with manipulating the difficulty, you would in fact manipulate um, the slope of this drift rate, which is um, a very common manipulation, benchmark manipulation really, of um, um, uh, basically zooming into these uh, start point or drift rate parameters. And with that, um, we went back uh, to our functional um, results and hypothesis. And so what we hypothesized is that for this ventral medial aspect of the STN, uh, we would see activation selectively for this payoff regime and in particular for the payoff versus neutral cues in association with the start point shifts. In the middle part of the um, STN, we believe that the difficulty manipulation, so making the dots basically harder or easier, or the coherence of these dots uh, harder or easier to detect um, would yield selective activation in that part, in addition to drift rate um, manipulations. And the motor domain, we thought simply contrasting left versus right or uh, right versus left responses, because people used <clears throat> both hands uh, to give their response. And so first of all, I'd like to uh, present you actually the model fits um, of um, the diffusion decision model. This is quite a, quite a big graph um, and um, I'm gonna walk you slowly through it. Um, well, I think one main message is important to note here. In general, the model fit um, the reaction time distributions very well in that sense that we let uh, start point and also drift rate um, and, uh, and drift rate uh, very freely between um, the difficulty manipulation and also the payoff uh, manipulation. You see the overlap between data. This is uh, represented the crosses and, and circles um, the model, but we also have some mismatch. And so you see this here uh, separately for erroneous trials and correct trials um, for these different uh, manipulations. The reason I think for this quite big mismatch, so you see it's not a perfect fit, absolutely not, um, might be that um, uh, there may be some urgency going on in this experiment, which we have not explicitly modeled. Um, and that means that potentially by inducing um, 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 a response uh, deadline, as we did of 1.5 seconds, we may have truncated reaction times in an artificial way. So it's just something to explore further. But what we can, um, what we, what we can summarize from this finding is, is that the manipulation overall worked. Um, so that means um, our participants followed the instructions, they followed the payoff regime, and in effect also were, if you want, their responses were affected by the difficulty manipulation selectively affecting the drift rate parameter. But when we now zoom in on the functional findings, um, and here you see the percent signal change for uh, separately for the left and right STN for the three different compartments in the STN, um, separately for neutral and payoff cues, I know it's a noisy graph, but in, in fact, it's all null findings. So it's really easy. <laughs> um, I, we first thought there was a trend, eventually maybe in the medial aspect for the payoff cues, but um, uh, it's just not there. And so it was really disappointing as you can imagine, given that we put a huge amount of efforts in optimizing and individual masks and so forth. And I have to say also on the level of SDN activation, there was a success. So we did have very nice temple signal to noise ratio in the SDN. So we succeeded to get signal in the SDN. It's not a lack uh, thereof, but selectively now affecting these different compartments in the SDN did not work out. Um, and uh, this is uh, confirmed with, of course, uh, using, using um, Bayesian statistics. I did not plot the base factors here. Um, um, but they are in favor of, uh, of the null. And so the story continues um, because next um, we thought, well, um, we should um, also investigate inter-individual differences eventually in these different compartments, looking um, at the, the start point differences for each individual plotted against uh, the beta values for the payoff versus neutral condition for the three different segments. These are the colors. And again, across the board, there is, um, nothing really happening. Um, we also did not obtain any significant correlations for drift rate effects, and in fact, also not for drift rate shifts um, um, uh, correlating against um, the activations in these different compartments. So overall, um, we see the SDN is involved, um, but we do not see selective influence of this manipulation or aspects of these manipulations in these uh, compartments. And so with that, I'd like to conclude this talk. and. Um, 
yeah, uh, you see, I am <clears throat> I am uh, a big fan, and want to say I think Audra Highfield has many advan uh, advantages um, um, to allow the direct um, visualization of small cell proto-nuclei structurally. Um, optimizing of functional MRI protocols um, is um, really essential, I believe, for iron rich subcortical nuclei, but eventually also networks. Um, and in fact, um, well, you may know the LC, for example, um, also that we can, in fact, this is optimized protocol get quite nicely, but it needs to be explored further, which nuclei in fact require what optimization. So I'm not claiming here that this is um, the best for all of it. Um, this is really, let's say, focusing on iron rich structures for now. And so um, I believe that these optimized uh, fMRI protocols start to reveal um, compelling and eventually new findings as we've seen in the validation experiment of the stop signal task, um, um, see, seeing really a different pattern than what is mainly reported in the literature, or eventually um, we, we, we see, as we've seen in the last example, that we have signal, but we do not find, in fact, and can, can't even, so in a replication, really, the small finding can't find a selective influence. And so with that, um, I'd really like to spend some time um, on this slide because um, it, um, it is really the, the neuroanatomy work is such a heavy undertaking for many, many years. And so um, Annika Alkemad and Rabin Balazar, but also Pierre-Louis Bazin have, have done outstanding work um, getting this pipeline together, getting it all going. And then there are, of course, Beth, uh, Bethany Isaac. She's, she worked uh, in collaboration with neurosurgeons in Maastricht, Jacin Temel, and Scott Isherwood, um, but also Max Kirk and Stephen Militich and Russell Boak, who bring in together this model-based cognitive neuroscience approach uh, using models in combination with imaging. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank you and thank you again for this invitation and this great initiative that you are, that are, you are putting on the road uh, here. Thank you. Thank you, Bertha. Thank you for the inviting talk. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, we'll open the floor for just one question. Uh, if you have a question, please use the raise hand function and we will call on you. Yeah, um, yeah that's an excellent question. And I, I nearly feel inclined to just move to Jan and point at Jan <laughs> to hear his thoughts. But um, so to me, it seems at this point um, that this is uh, really, as I said, more like a failure network. Um, and um, I think um, they may be surprised. There are various sub-processes here to consider um, in the failed inhibit trials. And um, um, I, we, we, were, we have not zoomed into the, trying to disentangle all these different aspects, which I think Jan, Jan's research line actually has started to do and looked in. I'm thinking in particular um, of the feedback phase um, or a potential feedback uh, phase uh, and manipulating that um, would give more insight. I'm uh, thinking of also that um, in particular, the SN has a previous work, I think has been already associated with uh, more like a, a reward related processes, but it seems that we find it's not only an SN, it's also an STN. So I am trying to make sense of it, why it's across the board. It's not selected for SDN, it's consistent, it's replicated. Um, and um, to what extent uh, with other reward related manipulation or feedback related manipulation, surprise related manipulations, we can in fact start to reveal a bigger picture here um, of this, this pattern. That's just a hunch. Um, I think Jan is the expert really here on on potentially, sorry, Jan, <laughs> yeah, but um, but I enjoyed his work with the uh, unique ideas here. So that's the best guess I, I have for now. Maybe you have a different idea. I'm, I'm happy to discuss this also further in the in the general discussion, maybe. Yeah, I was just going to mention, we have 15 minutes at the end for general discussion, additional questions for Burton, for sure. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm very flattered, but uh, whenever I review, and if you ever got a review of an SCN paper that cites just Berta's papers, that's not Berta herself. It's just, it's just me telling people that what they're doing is wrong, <laughs> that's what Berta is doing. Um, but I actually, I have an idea about this. Maybe we can talk about this in the general discussion. Um, yeah, yeah, that'd be great, yeah. Okay, so I think that's a perfect.